Um, all right, Kate. So here we go. So five, four, three, two, and one. All right, folks. Welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. I am very excited to have back Kate Violin. Kate, welcome. Bring me again. So Kate is an accredited mental health social worker and a play therapist. She was originally on the podcast uh, about three years ago on episode 335. She began her social work career in frontline child protection, assessing risk to children, working with kids and families to reduce risk and where necessary placement of children in out-of-home care. Kate's trained and experience in forensic risk assessments and investigative interviewing. She's presented evidence in children's court, family law court, and criminal court, and she's managed a team of child protection workers before going into private practice. Um, all right, Kate, there's a lot more that we need to talk about in terms of your background, but um, that'll give people a, a, a gist of what you're doing. Before we get going here, share with our listeners where you're from originally and where you are currently. Thanks, Guy. Yes, uh, today I'm on Guy Omega land, which is um, the beautiful northern beaches of Sydney, Australia. Um, it is Aboriginal land, and daily I acknowledge the impact of colonisation for Aboriginal people across Australia. Um, I'm originally an Irish person um, from the northeast coast of Ireland, a tiny little rural town along the seaside. Um, came to Australia when I was in my late 20s and have been here since. Awesome, awesome. So what, okay, bring us up to speed. What has been going on in your life with your work since we talked last? Since we talked last, I was in private practice um, doing um therapy and assessment for children and families in the Family Law Court of Australia. Um, so working with both victim survivors who are children and adults um, and also working with fathers who perpetrated um, violence on their intimate partners and children. Um, since then, I have moved into an organisation where I manage um, a program that engages men um, who perpetrate violence and their partners and former partners. So I'm the Family Safety Manager for Relationships Australia, which is um, a non-government organisation um, across Australia, but I manage the state of New South Wales, their family safety programs. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So what does that mean? What does that look like? What do you do? <laughs> so what, what do I do? Um, so I have um, six teams of um, primarily social workers um, who um, men are referred either voluntarily, so they decide themselves that they need to um, look at what's happening in their behaviour and how they have um, been unsafe in their relationships or primarily a lot are referred through court. So that's through children's court, which is child protection or family law court um, because the relationship has ended and one of the parties has, has gone to family law court to um, resolve um, child-related issues usually. Um, so men are referred to our program and as part of that, they have to... Uh, um, share details of their partner or former partner that they have children with um, and we engage and support the safety of the partner and former partner as well and we work with men in a men's behavioural change framework um, to accept responsibility and to be held accountable for their behaviour and then to begin to change their behaviour so they engage safely with um, either their current partner, former partner and or children. Okay. So I remember we, we we talked about this last time and I remember I asked you and we kind of talked about just the fact that you're working with these, these and these are all men, with yeah. these men and how, I mean, for my, it's an intense thing to be working with perpetrators. How did you get into this, th that that specialization? What drew you there? I started my own, like, say, clinical work with men in 2009, um, where doing child protection work when I was managing that child protection team, um, we were noticing that, um, so we'd work with one family and help the the mom and children become safe. Um, and usually what happened, the the dad was, um, was not engaged. Um, and the relationship would end, the children would um, either be removed if, if, 
um, the risk was too high to stay with mum um, or they will be supported with mum and move into a refuge and then get more stable accommodation. Um, and we were noticing that once we did that with one family, a man was re-emerging with a second family um, and more women and more children were being impacted by the same man's um, lack mm. of safety. So at that point, um, I approached the statutory child protection agency and said, look, are you noticing the same trend? Because we are. Um, and they said yes. And then I sought out training from um, a, an expert in the two experts in the field and trained my team in engaging so, men. Let me interrupt you for a second. So just to be clear here. So you'd be working with one man and, and his family, either partner or kids, you'd kind of work with them and to create safety for them but then he would engage with another woman or fa and or family and perpetrate there as well yeah in that stage child protection wasn't engaging with the man so he was either removed from the house or the children and and mom were removed to a refuge or the children were being removed because it was viewed as the the mother's responsibility to keep her children safe okay. it's a real kind of patriarchal view of of parenting and at that point we, the services weren't engaging with men usually because it was um they, they were risky they were using violence um it was they were harder to engage they were quite invisible from from the family um, so they would kind of be not part of the process and the relationship would end um, and then they would reappear in another relationship with another baby another child and then the cycle would repeat itself in his behavior becoming or being violent controlling mm -hmm. um, and then the, the family would be presenting then at police hospital and child protection would become involved again so it was that view or experience that I was witnessing and being part of that this is never going to change unless we engage the men um, we're co going to continuously kind of be, be pulling families out at the, the bottom of the river or the bottom of the waterfall that we kind of have to go back up and look at well what can we do to um to 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 change the current narrative um and i suppose in relation to domestic violence having worked with in in this field for over 20 years we didn't respond to domestic violence 20 years ago. It was viewed as a family problem to say 10 years ago um, or a bit more where we were viewing it as a, women, a woman's problem. So it was the mother's responsibility to keep her children safe um, and not engage the man. To now we're seeing that, you know, he has to be visible. He has to be part of it. Mm -hmm. And also being, you know, so showing some compassion to most men want a relationship with their children that's safe. Um, and being using that as a motivator to be able to to ignite change or ignite responsibility for their behavior that if you are safe then your relationship with your child can can be safe and can be meaningful whereas when you're not safe your child's afraid of you your partner's afraid of you you know they're all at risk from you right. um yeah so that's where i changed and started working with um with perpetrators because it's 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 never going to change if we right. don't engage them and bring them into the the system that works with their family you know hold them accountable and they become planners they become responsible and change their behavior so with the understanding that all people are different are there certain uh generalities or traits that these men who are perpetrating this this violence and or abuse showing i mean there's the, the adage right hurt people hurt people Does, is that true here Honestly, two types of, well, not two is a bit broad, but there's, you know, families, men that come from a trauma background and um, um, have had experiences themselves of DV and they're quite reactive. Um, but what really feeds perpetration of um, domestic violence is belief systems. Um, one of those is entitlement um, and patriarchy and gender roles and how men are socialised. Um, but most men that come... Um, and perpetrate domestic violence have that sense of entitlement that I'm 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 can I can behave how I how I want to behave mm -hmm. I can be treated how I want to be treated and I can um, ensure that the people around me behave in a way that I want them to or that meet my needs um, by behaving in a certain way so you know control. Um, 
threats. Um, so, yeah. in, so in sense of entitlement, uh, so you're saying that the majority or, or are the majority, have the majority been abused themselves or been in, so interesting? Okay. Yes. Have they have the majority experienced trauma? Um, well, it depends on so certain socioeconomic locations. Definitely, mm -hmm. the majority coming through would come from um, you know families where there has been domestic violence themselves growing up. Um, whereas in other other locations, say more affluent areas, there isn't a sense of there's definitely kind of patriarchy, and you know the man is the head of the house, and this is the way a man is is okay to behave. Um, but not all. Of, I think it's it, it would be unfair to. Say say for um men who have grown up in in trauma they don't not all of them go on and perpetrate domestic mm -hmm. violence um and being yeah mindful and respectful to you know victim survivors male victim survivors themselves that um yeah that don't do it that it isn't it isn't all men that experience trauma but you're saying the majority do have the sense of entitlement and that that that's interesting because i mean entitlement is one thing but manifesting it or expressing it in in this way i guess the question is why right i mean entitlement can mean well i want that car i'm going to go take that car or so help us understand the process here the the what's going on so in terms of um, the men that we would work with, the so patriarchy as well as a view, so how women are viewed in, in the world and how they're viewed in the world of this of the man that perpetrates um, domestic violence as well and gender roles that come into, into play. Um, male social, male socialisation as well is, I think, how we parent our boys is, is a huge impact in, um, you know, um, yeah, how gender roles play out, how they, um, you know, process beliefs and attitudes um and then where entitlement comes in um i think religion has a place as well um what having, does? <laughs> religion to religion can, okay. add, can add to it having come from um a, a very catholic um, background myself i can speak on that um and and looking at where um you know um, men are placed in in you know the priest is the you know the the hierarchy of you know the community um what he says goes is kind of this um yeah just an example of how male role models play out and men are perceived as I suppose being more important than women so therefore their needs are met and and women are in a place to meet those needs and particularly in a relationship as well now, often, and correct me if I'm wrong, when the topic of uh, domestic violence uh, against women occurs, there's the this idea that, you know, it isn't really about sex. It's about what power or control. Does this come into play here as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, power and control is is one of the key um, components of um, of domestic violence um, and um, non incident um, domestic violence is becoming more. Um, accepted that um, lots of men engage in domestic violent behavior aren't actually physically violent so it's around power and control um, and a lot of like New South Wales at the moment the state that I'm in is looking at legalizing coercive control um, I know Scotland and Ireland have done it um, legalizing yeah coercive control yeah what, is, what do you mean legalizing co coercive control that sounds awful well, there is a lot of debate about um, how um, helpful it will be. Um, so coercive control looks at a, pat a pattern of behavior, a pattern of control. Um, so say how, um, and it's, it's used to um, ultimately manage and control your, you know, your target, your partner's um, behavior um, in order to um, 
yeah, to make sure that everything they do is 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 controlled by you. So tech tech abuse, tech, um, stalking, um, your time is controlled. Um, when you're allowed out of the house, when who you're allowed to see, um, what you what 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 you can do at home. I, I worked with a victim survivor who, um, if there was bubbles left on the kitchen floor when she cleaned it, um, that would in it result in um an a, a a verbal onslaught of you know name calling um but, right so you're but you're saying certain areas are legalizing this yeah scotland and ireland have legalized it How? about How exactly and that's <laughs> what um <laughs> Um, Marsh, Marsh has got is um, a, a big speak, a big um, in Scotland um, on on the topic, and I think they they have successfully um, uh, like uh, gone through charged, convicted, um, um, less than five men because um, it is it is so hard to it's up to the the victim ultimately to well as in it is any crime really um to to prove um and it's been placed in the it will be placed in the up to the police to 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 make this decision um and at the end of the day the police police you know they're not they're not trained in coercive control. Mm -hmm. um, they're trained in, you know, a physical evidence kind of gathering basis. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of like the place is quite a patri patriarchal setup as well. So um, concerns around how how this will be placed and how this will be used. Um, as a piece of legislation, um, but by perpetrators as well towards their victims as another form of control and abuse. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, it's. Uh, I think in terms of acknowledging coercive control, it's it's a it's a good understanding to move away from incidences and look at patterns of behavior. So looking at you know that it isn't the traditional black eye, um, mm -hmm. that it's looking at you know financial control, emotional abuse, um, right. sexual I, abuse. I, I didn't hit her. Yeah. Oh, nothing happened. I didn't hit her. Right. Yeah. But that, you know, your um, partner and children aren't allowed outside the house after 4 p.m. or they're not allowed to go to um, after school activities because she might meet a dad and you right. might think that, you know, who's she talking to, um, you know, that kind of um, impact for, for women and children. Man, what is your experience with uh, the success rate with the work you're doing? It depends. Quote, define success. <laughs> right, quote unquote success. How how do you find success? How do you define success? How how let me let me step back. How do you work with these individuals, these these units, the the perpetrators and the family? Yeah. Them so um and I, I have to say that primarily my workforce is female um so it is um there's you know first step is being safe for my practitioners so um you know looking at how how safe workers are in in engaging men um so there's criteria that men need to engage you know to demonstrate before they will be kind of accepted into our program um and the first point of that is um in a clinical intake being able to um, kind of name an aspect of their behavior that is not safe um, and that they you know kind of want to engage in because a lot will ring up and say I have to do this for court it's a court order mm -hmm. um, I didn't do anything um, and she's made all that up and now the court's believing her because you know the court's favor mothers blah 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 um, so at that point we'd spend some time with them doing a clinical intake to see whether there's any shift and if there isn't um, well, then it would be saying to him, you're not sitting in a place where you're able to um, start this work. And this is a choice that you have made because domestic violence is a choice um, and engaging in that behavior and control is a choice. These men don't lose it at their um, colleagues in work or, you know, the mm -hmm. um, they, they make a choice to do it in their home towards their partners and children. Um, and at that point, if he's able to say, yes, look, I wasn't safe um, and you might get one incident where you know he's able to name that yes this happened um and then they'll be accepted into our program for assessment 
And as part of that assessment, we get contact details for partners um, because often their sense of safety is a really good evaluation of, um, you know, what he's telling us um, and what's really happening at the in the home. A lot of men will come with um, ADVOs, which is apprehended domestic violence orders. So they're orders that are in place to protect usually the mum and children. Um, and they can have a range of, you know, no contact at all to, you know, allow telephone contact mm -hmm. or the, the most minimum one is, you know, you can still be um, in the same um, home, but you're not allowed to harass, intimidate, threaten. There's a list of um, behaviours on it. Um, so once they come into assessment, we start working with them around, um, you know, what what are um, what are their motivators? So what is it they think they need to work on? Mm -hmm. um, and um, then in terms of starting to evaluate, you know, what are their values? What are their beliefs? What are their attitudes um, that have led to this behaviour or sit under this behaviour that gives them the what they view as the right to, you know, engage in um, control and abuse to towards their partners um, and children um, a huge shift is recognizing um, and this in in the programs that I manage has been a change in the last um, while since I've taken over is recognizing children as victim survivors in their own right mm -hmm. um, a lot of the research um, has looked at children being you know witnesses um, or present when it's happening um, whereas when we sit with children they have been victims they uh, often um, of coercive control so you know working with it with a, a child who's told me that when she's on contact with her mom and if she meet um, with her dad sorry and if she meets her mom in the supermarket she's not allowed to speak to her mom because it's time with dad and if she if she does that will result in punishment for her mm -hmm. so that's an example of a child being um, being coercively controlled um, mm -hmm. children often miss out on after school activities because they're not allowed to um, do them. They're not allowed to go to birthday parties. They're not allowed because of his behaviour, because he's concerned who his partner might be in contact with while, while she's there. Right. Um, Did, let me interrupt, interrupt you here for a minute, Kate. So do these, and again, I, 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 I know it's difficult to make generalities, but to what degree do a lot of these men, these individuals, understand that what they're doing is harmful is abusive and i say that within the context of you saying initially that a lot of this derives from their belief systems yeah it does um some will get to a point where they're able to um say that they can say that their partner was scared of them mm -hmm. um the the men that i have worked with um, have been fathers so seeing the impact of what their behavior has had on their children can often come quicker than what it's had on their partner um, and that's based on belief systems based on you know a different sense of empathy for a child um, um, and it's really working in that space of being able to separate from what she's done um, victim stance is one of the 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 patterns that they sit in that it, you know it wasn't me it was the court or she pushed my buttons mm -hmm. and kind of demonstrating that you know that they're kind of that the, the sit in a lack of blame or minimization of what their behavior is um, and it is really through um, you know setting up a space with them that is um I do like Bruce Perry's um, three R's where you relate and regulate and then you get to the reason part of, of um, a person's brain. Um, but being clear that when we're relating and regulating to them, it's in a place of, you know, boundaries. It's in a place of um, kind of um, setting up that um, this is how we behave safely. This is how we engage in respectful um, communication and relationships in how we work together. This is how I'm going to, to challenge you in terms of when you tell me something that isn't safe. Um, we're going to sit in a space of, well, um, we're going to look at your behavior. We're going to, you know, pivot it back to your behavior in that incidence where you're giving me an example of what she did. Okay, talk me through what you did. 
Um, and that that can be difficult for men to do initially. We're getting to them to that point where, um, so the use of the kind of the fly on the wall, I do it where, you know, the fly is looking this way. What would the fly see this way in order for them to kind of sit with um telling me what you did as opposed to telling me what she's done to you in your um yeah perception of what's happened so you know as you're as you're talking i'm listening but i'm also thinking that their mental state their their uh state of being could be different at in the moment during which they are right doing this uh compared to when they're in your office and reflecting back and i'm just curious about that when i mean to be able to perpetrate these acts and i guess especially against kids i mean one would you can make a strong argument for one almost being a sociopath, right? Having no sense of empathy. Walk us through, what is your response to that? Um, a lot of, um, oh, he's a narcissist. Um, and because narcissism is in the DSM, um, it always uh, has that kind of reaction because, um, look, there's probably um, aspects that would um but it's really separating it that if if this was a sociopath or if this was a narcissist, you'd see this behavior across all relationships and all interactions that this person would have. Right. Um, whereas with domestic violence, it's a choice. It doesn't happen, you know, when he's, you know, um, on the committee for the um, local soccer team. He's, you know, it doesn't happen when he's, you know, gone, gone to church. It doesn't happen when, you know, he's in work and and he's, you know, presenting to his colleagues on whatever he presents on. It does, and his colleague disagrees with him, or his colleague, um, you know, that's where it doesn't happen. That it is a choice. It's around I, I'm, I have the power and control in my relationships based on the belief systems and attitudes of entitlement, gender role, patriarchy. Um, but look, it is important to recognise that, you know, mental health as well. Um, if a man has a, you know, a diagnosis of mental health, it's around and supporting where that is as well that you know um, and we look at making sure that there is a separate service that would support that aspect of his um, of his needs too so it isn't um, I suppose we're kind of like a fine line where people ask are we men's rights we're definitely not men's right what underpins our work is victim survivor safety and well-being mm -hmm. um, but well, what we do I was I my implication wasn't to to suggest that um, they necessarily had a particular diagnosis. Mm. And what I was curious about, and I'm curious about, you know, door in that moment, right? I mean, when looking at it from my perspective, from an outsider's perspective, in that moment, I'm curious, like, what the hell is going on? I mean, this, you could say this about any type of perpetrated violence. Um, is there anything, you know, yes, it's a choice, but Jesus, what, what kind of choice is that? I mean, you know, how, how does, how, how does someone do this? To, 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 oh my God, it's, a, it's just so horrific. Yes, it is. It really is. Um, and I think, yeah, it is what, and I suppose God, for how do they do it? It's um, often such a uh, entrenched belief system that they don't um, looking at it involves such shame um, that it's often minimal. They don't, minimi they yeah, don't they look at it. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so when they start work with us, it's really like Ellen Jenkins is um, kind of the forefinder of men's behavioral change um, and where we place shame and reposition the shame um, so that you look at the man's values and the man that he wants to be um, and bring him on that journey. It's kind of a narrative approach to bring him on that journey through reflection, through opening um, 
you know, conversations around um, and the use of self as well. Oh, well, I can, you know, I'm going to give you some, you know, observations or some can I can I give you some reflections that I have. Um, I've I've just experienced that moment as quite intimidating. Your behaviour was, you know, and then you can name it. Um, you know, what was that like for you hearing that from me? Has anyone given you that feedback before? Um, mm -hmm. What's happening in your system for you now as you hear that? Okay, so if we were to have this conversation again, how do you think you could, you know, be hearing that I experienced that as it as intimate, you know, as intimidation? So it's kind of use of self in that moment mm -hmm. that you. Have have a space with a man where you know he he is able to kind of sit in some of that shame because if we can reposition that shame then um you know that's what what aspects of success look like when you mm -hmm. when we, we we started down there what does success look like and you know being really realistic that sometimes visibility is success um so sometimes having a man in a service um while we work with the with the place with the victim survivor and the children to build safety right. and allow allow her um have the support to ignite her safety plan that she was planning to leave but just right. didn't have a service around him because often when he's visible in our service um there's you know information and knowledge that because no other service works with both partners at the same time so nobody holds um both narratives of okay he's telling us this mm -hmm. um but this is really what's happening from you know the, the family's perspective or he's not telling us this so this is 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 creating more risk so then we can work really closely with the support services to um kind of look at well this is um this is what our risk assessment is um and you know either we need to kind of respond more from you know breaching his abo or we need to look at what sort of support service can we put in for the family to in order to to help them um you know um ignite a safety plan women are really good at keeping themselves and their children safe um but it's not their responsibility it's right. um it's it's his behavior let me ask you this as we kind of wind down here what is first of all i mean <laughs> I just admire the work you're doing and my God, I mean, you, it's, it's incredible. It is incredible. What is this like for you to do this work? Cause this is look, let's, this is not run of the mill work. This isn't, this is very intense. I think it is. What is this like for you to do this? Yeah. As a female doing it, um, now I manage um, teams of amazing other females that do it and support and coach and supervise and um, look, you know, support their practice, um, manage a lot of risk. Um, as females doing this work, it can feel like it is a lot of responsibility because we're we're working to change men's behavior and there's less men visible in in doing the work if that right. makes sense right. so women are still carrying the burden of um of men's lack of safety um having said that i think my experience as a female um really allows this work really creates a space for men to um to you know to take the opportunity of that choice to to be able to 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 change um mm -hmm. i think for men um because men come with their own men work male workers in you know in this work come with um their own gender um male privilege their own patriarchy and when they sit with another man it's a kind of a oh you get it mate you know what she's like so there's it's mm -hmm. it's kind of a space to be able to sit without colluding with them is because mm -hmm. we want to collaborate we don't want to collude um, mm -hmm. with men who perpetrate violence and they're really good at getting you to collude with them whereas as a female there there's less um less of a perception from a perpetrator that you are going to kind of collude with them because mm -hmm. you know you're a female and um you're on her side so to speak so mm -hmm. it's um yeah um it is um i'm, I'm I moved into management because of knowing that um, what I needed for my journey and mm -hmm. my um, wanting to still work in this field, but knowing that I was getting to a point that um, 
yeah, hearing men just their justification or hearing another victim survivor's story wasn't going to um, kind of support what I needed in terms of of my career and being able right. to use the skill and experience that I had to kind of build a kind of a bigger workforce that engaged in this work because it is it is really it's really draining work. Yeah, man, I can imagine, Kate. <laughs> What's the best way for people to uh, to reach you? Uh, probably LinkedIn, I'd say, is is easy. Um, yeah, Kate Fallon um, on LinkedIn is um, is good. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Look, I want to thank you so much for coming back here. You are welcome back. Uh, again, appreciate the work you're doing. Um, uh, it, to me, it takes a lot of courage what you're doing, and. Um, it's man it's inspiring i'm glad you are out there doing this work thank you we need way more funding if you're able to do it that <laughs> i don't know if i can but i can i can help you and, and try to help you i'll definitely try to do that um but again love talking to you thank you so much for being here thanks guys been awesome all right bye-bye take care